This is said to be one of the most important midterm elections in generations. Everybody is talking about it from politicians to celebrities. You can't even drive down the street without seeing a political ad or getting on social media without scrolling past a post on politics. Even President Donald Trump has said in recent days that he's never seen a midterm election this electric. So what makes this one so different? Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Royce Jones. And I'm Kimberly Keggy. That's what we hope to answer tonight as some of us break down some of the biggest concerns among our colleagues demographic. Our team of reporters has spoken with experts on topics from gun control to LGBTQ rights. We will also be bringing you to the Minute Newsroom results from some of the most talked about races in this election. Welcome back. With each election cycle comes hot button issues that some voters inform their choices on. In light of the recent massacre at the synagogue in Squirrel Hill, the issue of gun control is again in the headlines. People are concerned with the ease of access to firearms. UVU's Megan Masiosi files this report exploring how easy it is to get a gun in Pennsylvania. Gun control is always a hot topic, especially around election time. And in this year, 2018, Kill we've it, had no shortage Love of the the discussion. According to the National Public Radio, so far this year, we've had 26 school shootings and 53 new safety laws passed because of it. And here in Pittsburgh, we've experienced our own tragedy with gun control at the Tree of Life Synagogue here in Squirrel Hill. So how easy is it to get a gun in the state of Pennsylvania? Virtually anybody can, a long gun. Uh, as the laws stand right now, can be sold with just a simple receipt between people. Uh, if you are ordering a gun online, uh, it has to come through a federal firearms license dealer to have the paperwork done at that dealer. According to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, anyone 18 years and older can obtain or sell a gun after they pass a basic background check. Uh, basically, you have to show your ID, make sure it is a long gun, a rifle, or shotgun. However, the rules are different for purchasing a handgun. In the state of Pennsylvania, you must be 21 years or older to purchase one. Basically, you go in and do the background check. Uh, we make a phone call to the PA State Police, and if your background checks out, you are able to take the gun home. A background check in the state of Pennsylvania includes employment verification, credit history, criminal history, and education. Once an individual obtains a handgun, they have the option to apply for a concealed permit. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a concealed carry permit is defined as a weapon, especially handguns, which are kept hidden on one's person or under one's control. According to a study conducted by the American Journal of Public Health earlier this year, roughly 3 million Americans carry a loaded handgun every day. 80% of the surveyors stated personal protection as their primary reason to carry. If you had nationwide concealed carry, if you go on a trip or whatever, or somebody comes to our state uh, that we had reciprocal, it would be, you know, so much easier. Basically, if you can pass the background check to buy the gun, you're going to pass the background check probably to carry the gun. At the gun range, there are two safety measures that you must always have, whether you're the shooter or the observer. One of those is a pair of earmuffs, and the other one is safety glasses. So if there's safety procedures here at the gun range, then what are some safety procedures that you can take for you and your family at home? A small lock box works. There's many people that buy them, if they, especially if they just are, have one or two handguns. If you have, you know, a couple guns, you have a gun safe, it's going to buy you quite a bit more time and the guns are going to be safe. Usually they have electronic lock or a numerical lock and only people that have the key or only people that have the combination can get into it. According to a survey conducted by the Journal of Urban Health, an estimated 4.6 million children live in homes with unsecured guns. Seister has one message for parents when it comes to teaching their children about gun safety. Kids are curious by nature, and the earlier that they are taught something, the better it is. Uh, especially with child rearing, a lot of learning is repetitive. Uh, and the earlier that you start to do that, the better. Kids aren't the only ones at risk. According to a survey from the pediatrics, only 35% of gun-owning parents whose teens have shown risk factors of self-harm and depression stored all guns locked and unloaded. Guns can be inherently dangerous, 
and it's something that's like a full-time job. You can't just do it once and expect the child to adhere to what you're telling them. According to a study conducted by John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, 54% of U.S. gun owners do not properly lock up or store their guns. Gun control can be expected to be a very hot topic between the two candidates here in Pennsylvania. Reporting for Point Park University in Plum Borough, I'm Megan Masiosi. Hello to those of you joining us now on UVU Television. Uh, we are the WPPJ crew. My name is Alex Papachek, and I'm joined in studio by uh, Robert Berger. And uh, we are also joined in studio by our man Dennis McDermott here. Uh, Dennis uh, has been watching polls for, uh, for us and will continue to watch throughout the night. We've been talking about uh, turnout and how that, and how that affects um, you know, the results of uh, tonight's uh, tonight's broadcast, uh, or no, not today's broadcast, <laughs> tonight's contests. Um, so uh, we got to talking about, uh, Robert, you were at polling places today. Correct. Uh, what, what was the vibe like? The vibe, there were a lot of people, both times I had to wait in long lines just to speak to the polling, uh, the, the poll workers. In both places, they had pretty much a record turnout for how early it was in the day. It was 1 o'clock. Uh, Strip District at the, their EMS station, they do polling there, and they were already over 50% of their voters coming out in the day. And same with the North Shore, where half of their voters had already come out in the day, which was like well over 300 people before like 2 o'clock. Now, now, I was at uh, polling places earlier in the day, and uh, really right after it opened. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it tends to be that voters come in three waves. This is what uh, one of the poll workers had told me. Uh, you have your immediately as it opens rush. You have your lunchtime rush. And then you have the uh, everyone else rush. Yeah. There was, a, yeah, there, there was a fellow who, who had said, oh, just wait until the college is let out. And he was, <laughs> he was gesturing across the street to Duquesne University uh, because both Duquesne and Point Park vote at that same location. Oh, yeah. I remember the lines were, are always out the door there on voting day. I remember the presidential election checking it out. But that's pretty much what the North Shore uh, polling people told me, that it, it comes in waves. You're kind of between them right now. And once, you know, six o'clock comes, everyone's out of work. Po lines are going to be out the door. And then, of course, we got the eight o'clockers coming in who are going to be in line until probably nine o'clock. And um, we, we do have some data trickling in uh, to the official state websites, but it's not enough to, to make any sort of anything of. Uh, and, th and that's what's really interesting about these uh, midterm elections is they're far more local. You have um, your governor's race, which is a statewide race. You have your senator race, which is a statewide race. But you also have these uh, House of Representatives races and your state houses of representative that, um, that are really like local issues based, but also are being drawn into this national conversation with big topics like immigration and um, and abortion and, and gun rights and that kind of a thing. Also here we have the Florida Senate race with Rick Scott and Bill Nelson. This is pulling in at 50-50, so we are at a split here. Uh, approximately Scott is leading, and according to the New York Times, over 7 million votes have been submitted. 65% polling locations uh, reported and Rick Scott leads by a fraction 94% reporting. Now this is all coming in live here. Scott still leads by just over 2000 votes, 50% uh, to 49.6%. So super close there. Uh, the Florida governor's race is coming in 92% reporting. DeSantis is leading Andrew Gilliam 50% uh, to 48.8%. 94% here. So we are really seeing some close numbers really head to head uh, in this election so far. And again, we will continue to get, give you guys all the live uh, information as it comes in as we start getting more polling results. It's important to consider the issue of rising tuition and how it affects college education for students. And we're going to throw that over to our reporter right now, Marley Pinchock, who's going to break this down for you. With the midterm elections happening tonight, it's important to consider the issue of rising tuition and how this affects college education for students. According to Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, from 2008 to 2017, tuition at public four-year colleges in Pennsylvania have increased by 23%. I even have a friend that um, he doesn't really come from the best situation and he, uh, he did two years of school and then he had to drop out because he couldn't afford it anymore. And uh, it was kind of sad because he, he was like a really good kid. And I don't think something like that should, should ever really happen. 
Students often wonder exactly where their tuition is being put to use. I just never understand like where all the tuition money that I'm paying for goes. Um, like the things like books, I thought that books were included like in the whole thing, like my books would be paid for. But until I get to college, they're like, oh no, you're paying for tuition and books you do on your own. So I was like, okay, why am I paying all, th all this money for books? According to a 2016 Point Park publication of The Globe, President Hennigan discusses tuition increases for private colleges saying, when we announce tuition increases, roughly half of that goes straight to financial aid. That is how the private sector of higher education in America prices tuition. The public schools don't do that. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not making any judgment on it. So yes, the tuition may go up, but yet the financial aid dollars that are available to students also increase. So your word of paradox? I mean, I couldn't sit here and say, wow, that's, a, that's not the right word that you want to use. I, I would say that it's it's not unfair to say it's a paradox because it is kind of that we keep raising to raise. Again, it's one of those challenges in higher education that everyone is trying to figure out. Is there a solution to this? On average, students are given six months after graduation until they have to start paying off their loans. But finding a job right out of college is not always a guarantee. Within those six months, the idea is you should have enough ample amount of time and fortunate for you in a sense if you're graduating or students graduating now the economy is good so it's a good time to get a job and with the loan agency and the federal government saying by six months you should have a job and you should be able to be paying that back international students we do not have the time that citizens do in order to pay the debts and the only kind of help in my case that i've seen it so uh, through sports so this one's deep to left field goodbye Richard Perez with an absolute bomb. With the limitations, um, because I'm I'm not al I'm no longer eligible in order to play, so that's why the cut the the scholarship cut. I was like, oh, now what do I do? I'm <laughs> waiting for a miracle, basically. There are many cases where the cost of tuition prevents a student from attending their ideal college. There have been some colleges I wanted to go to, but they're private and they don't give out many scholarships. And I automatically had to vote off my list because I don't want to pay $75,000 every year. Private schools, many, most in this day and age of the way higher education is, are very tuition dependent, which means that they're relying on students paying their tuition in order to keep the doors open. So yeah, we are between probably 93 and 95 percent tuition dependent. So we survive by you all as students paying your tuition dollars. The number of institutions who have closed their doors because they cannot survive any longer in this higher education market, I would say if we make this, if we talk about this in the next couple of years, I may use the word crisis. I come from a country where it basically became a dictatorship and looking back in years, people really didn't care or take serious about elections and once you have freedom, men take care of it. It's clear that the rise of tuition is getting out of hand for college students. And just like every other issue discussed in tonight's election, affordable college education is an issue that should not be taken lightly. Reporting from Point Park University in downtown Pittsburgh, I'm Marley Pinchock for UVU. And welcome back. Perhaps one of the biggest discussions surrounding this election and the political landscape across the board is immigration. During his campaign trail, President Trump was a major advocate for stricter immigration policy. Under the Trump regime, the country has seen numerous changes in policy, including the banning of nationals from eight Muslim countries, the canceling of deferred action for childhood arrivals, and most recently, the president is promising the cancellation of birthright citizenship through an executive order. According to the university fact sheet, international students make up 4% of the student population here at Point Park. Joining us now in the studio is sophomore uh, Vanessa Vivas. Vanessa, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Now, Vanessa, I know that we were talking a little bit about before the break and before we started our show back again, um, that you mentioned that you're, some, you're seen as an ambassador. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Sure. Um, where I grew up, which was Qatar, uh, and Venezuela and Qatar, I moved from Venezuela when I was eight, and then I grew up in an international environment in Qatar. I went to an international British school and then an international American school. Um, so I was definitely exposed to a lot of different uh, cultures and a lot of diversity, and it was just part of my life. And I didn't realize how big of a responsibility I had until I moved here. 
and I realized that everyone that I'm surrounded by is from PA. Nothing wrong with that. I just think that it was such a, it was a culture shock coming here and seeing that no one really had the same background as I did. And so it's interesting to be able to represent multiple facets of society. So a woman, a Latina, an immigrant, and an immigrant from a, a Muslim country uh, who lived in the Middle East. Like it's, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. And people don't usually see that when they first look at me. And when you talk about those differences, when you mentioned that culture shock, right? What are some of the challenges that you face? Is, you know, have you faced discrimination here? If so, would you mind sharing that with us? Sure. Um, I think that it's, it's interesting because it's all very relative and it all, sometimes it even comes down to being superficial because I'm very white passing. People don't look at me and go, oh, you're an immigrant or you're um, ethnic or brown or anything. Um, what's interesting is that I remember uh, specifically an incident that happened at a COPA event um, where there was a, a family picture taken and it was the people of color family. And my roommate was an African-American and she came up to me and um, we were hanging out. And then this other African-American um, student came up to us and said, hey, we're taking a family picture. And I was like, great, we're going to go do it. And then he looked at me and goes, oh, no, 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 not you. No, 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 it's a family picture. And I was very taken aback. And I said, I don't know what, what that means. Am I a person of color? Am I, am I not? So I felt a little bit of kind of discrimination or mar marginalization there because it felt like I wasn't, I didn't know what my identity was. I think one of my biggest uh, struggles is that I s struggle with identity issues. I, I don't really look um, ethnic, but I don't really look white. So it's kind of, it's an interesting thing to experience and to navigate. I really want to ask you on that, was there ever a time whenever you're experiencing things like this and you say people don't necessarily relate you to the, the as, as a minority, right? Mm -hmm. Was there ever a time when you experienced this and thought to yourself, you know what, I give up. I'm just going to identify as white. I'm not going to identify as a minority. Was there ever a moment like that for you? I think it's interesting because I don't, I can't ever detach myself from who I am. At the same time, sometimes I wish I could because I become a token international student or token Latina or token immigrant. Like the amount of jokes that I've made with my friends about being an immigrant and getting green card married, it's, it's, they're jokes and they're funny in the moment. At the same time, I know people sometimes take them too far and it becomes, I wish I could disassociate myself with this label. So it's definitely a struggle, but when it comes down to it, I will never forget my upbringing and that's always going to be a part of me and my family's always a part of me um, and especially in Latino culture, family is such an important thing. It's one of the things we value the most. So I can never detach myself from that and I just need to realize that stuff like this can be petty and that I have to just move on, get past it. I'm an ambassador, I'm strong, I'm here and I'm ready to work. It's a really powerful statement. I think that there are some people out there who really need to identify with that and hear that. So thank you for sharing. <laughs> thank you so much, Vanessa, for coming on the show with us this thank evening. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Tonight in the CMI studio, UView is not the only outlet on campus tracking results. Just next door in the classroom space, students are working alongside Professor Steve Halleck to cover various local races and how each race has been covered in the media. Here with us now from U uh, Professor Halleck's class is Caroline Collins, former UVU student, to discuss the Ohio Senate race between Democratic Sherrod Brown and Republican Jim Renacci. Thank you so much for being here with oh, us. Oh, thank you too for having me. Thank you, UVU, for having me back. It's such an honor to be, you know, back where it all started. <laughs> for me. So now three years later, a full-time grad student and working in the TV news industry yes. in Youngstown, Ohio at WFMJ, 21 WFMJ, the NBC affiliate. It's really fun to see how far you guys have come and to see the amazing facility that's here on campus now. I was going to say a different look from the first time you were I here. I know. We were back when I was um, a student here. We were back at the library and we didn't have this beautiful, beautiful studio right on, what is this, Wood Street yes. here? I mean, this is what you see when you walk down the street mm -hmm. and you can look in and you can see all the students working. I mean, it's, it's so cool to be back. Um, I graduated in 2015, so to be back as a graduate student and to now be part of this big night 
is such an honor and I'm so proud of everyone for oh. all the hard work that you guys have put in. Well, it's, thank it's you. great. Thank you very much. And this is how you get, you know, into the real <laughs> deal. So you guys are right on track. Yes. And talking about hard work. I know you, we, as we mentioned before, you guys are hard at work in the next room. You've been following the race between Jim Renacy and uh, Sherrod Brown. Yes. Can you tell us what you know about that yeah, so far? Yeah, U.S. Senate race. So this is a race that is gaining a lot of national attention. And it's really cool that I am studying and analyzing this race because I work in Youngstown, Ohio, and we cover northeastern Ohio and western Pennsylvania where I work um, as a reporter and as an anchor. And so to be able mm -hmm. to cover this from an academic standpoint and from a journalism standpoint in my actual job is really, really interesting. Now there's about 12, 10 of us over in the other room. We all have different races. So this is just my particular race that I'm covering. And it's been nothing short of dramatic yeah. and um, has gained a lot of national attention from from Sherrod Brown allegations of abuse from his competitor, yeah. Jim Renacy, to the race actually now um, it's a lot closer than than what the networks were calling a couple of hours ago when we first got into class. It's tightened up. Right. And working in that the Ohio market, I mean, what are some of the responses that you hear from residents there? I'm sure they give a lot of feedback on this. You're exactly right. Once you go into the community and you're a reporter, you end up talking to a lot of people who live in Youngstown and who are voters and are voting for either Sherrod Brown or Jim Renacy. As of right now, Sherrod Brown is in the lead, but he was in the lead a lot more a couple hours ago, and the networks projected him to win. You go to Youngstown, a lot of people are for Sherrod Brown. I mean, they, they just, he's been in since like 2007, so people are used to him, they like him, he's a Democratic candidate. Um, he supports a lot of the issues that the people, at least in Northeastern Ohio, are passionate about. Um, however, you know, the governor's race right now um, is leaning a little bit more red. Um, and a couple hours ago, it was leaning more, more blue. So <laughs> Cordray and Mike DeWine, Mike DeWine's the Republican candidate. Yes. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of a lot closer, I think, than many of us, at least reporters in Youngstown, thought it would be. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people, uh, at least in the Youngstown area, which is only about an hour north of here, are probably watching this really closely saying, what is going to happen? Are we going to have the senator that we were used to since mm -hmm. 2007? Or are things going to flip? However, like I said, the network CNN, Fox, and MSNBC called a couple of hours ago that Sherrod Brown was the projected winner. So I'm assuming that it's going to stay that way. But it has, like I said, tightened up in the last hour or so. Right. I want to stop it there. We're going to pick this conversation back up after the break. We're going to take the break. We'll have more with Caroline after this. Stay with us. Live from Point Park University's Center for Media Innovation, Election Night 2018 will return after the break. Welcome back. Uh, we want to break into this section with breaking news of the uh, election results. We told you we were going to be giving you constant um, up to the minute results. And here we have some from Connor Lamb. He was confirmed projected winner in District 17 special election election race PA over Keith Rothfuss. That was a 60 percent to 40 percent. And Connor Lamb has been confirmed. There you have that. And Bob Casey projected winner over Lou Barletta for the PA Senate. That's according to CNN. So there's some information from Pennsylvania for you. There's that. Now I'll have you take it away. All right. Well, Caroline, I want to get back to our interview. I know that you had started to cover a bit, a bit of a bit, a, excuse me, I'm sorry, a really heated race, another heated race. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, sure. So we were talking about the Sherrod Brown, Jim Renacy Senate race in Ohio. Their debates got pretty ugly right now. It's, it's kind of close. Sherrod Brown is the expected winner. Um, in Ohio, and he's been there since 2007, so he's the incumbent. Um, but another big race is the Ohio governor's race, DeWine and Cordray. DeWine is the Republican candidate, Cordray is the Democratic candidate, and that race got pretty ugly. There were some attack ads run there. There was a lot of money raised for this race and a lot of um, funding and a lot of support from communities in Ohio, you know, raising funding or advocating, going door to door for these two candidates. Right now it's pretty close and from what I've seen voter turnout is really going to be everything in that race. Now have you talked to any of the residents about which party they may be favoring during the governor's race? Well it's kind of interesting because obviously the outgoing Governor Kasich in Ohio, I mean he ran for president, he's Republican, so you know will it flip? Will it, will it go blue or will it uh, 
will it you know remain? I don't know. It's close right now. It's closer than I thought it was going to be right now. So I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. And that's the fun thing about election night is you just don't know and you wait for these results to come in. They start right. coming in so quickly. Mm -hmm. Are they calling this a toss-up race? For the, yeah. for the gubernatorial race? Well, yeah. I mean, really, it says that it's really going to be on voter turnout. Um, that's what CNN was saying. That's mm -hmm. what Fox was saying. As far as some of the articles that I'm glancing at now, they, it's still close, and it's really going to be on turnout. So I guess they both have great, great backgrounds. Um, they are yeah. both familiar with you know, the Ohio voters. So right. I guess we'll just wait and see. And I know that a big thing on the table between the two of them, and I know we heard a lot about this in their debates, was their positions on the opioid epidemic. Well, the opioid epidemic is just a huge issue in Ohio. And that's certainly something that all state lawmakers and even, you know, national politicians are talking about. President Trump actually gave, you know, more funding to the opioid epidemic, more funding for recovery and treatment and all that. So especially in Northeastern Ohio, it's one of the worst places in the entire country for the opioid mm -hmm. epidemic. And, you know, a lot of people lose their lives over this terrible addiction. And so it is something that on either side of the party, you know, you have to support. And both right. candidates, you know, showed their support for that. And I know that's something that Ohio residents saw on their ballot today, right? It was it's issue one. Is that? Issue one got voted, voted down. Oh, wow. It did not go oh, wow. through. So okay. issue one would have made drug possession just a, a misdemeanor. Um, and it, it would have lessened the offense for drug possession. And law enforcement, at least the law enforcement that I have talked with, and some of the local judges and, and the local lawmakers were very against issue one. We're telling people you need to vote no on issue one mm -hmm. because they said it was going to make Ohio just a stomping ground for drug dealers mm -hmm. and for drug use and that it was going to make it even more dangerous. Those who are advocating for it said it's going to make treatment more readily available and it's going to help a lot of people. That got voted down today so that is not going through and that had a lot of support behind it i mean mm -hmm. i'm talking millions and millions of dollars of support to vote wow. yes to get it through wow. so it did get voted down wow. there were so many political ads on television though about issue one you know vote yes, yes vote no so the voters spoke and it did get voted down absolutely great insight caroline Breaking news right now, that blue wave that everybody has been talking about is not going to appear after all. Here's some of the headlines that we are seeing now. This source, AP, they say GOP retains Senate control for two more years, shattering the Dems. Dream of an anti-Trump wave sweeping into the majority. You've heard talks about this over the last few days. You've heard potential fears. We've been talking about that referendum against President Trump, his entire agenda. There was some fears there. I know a lot of media outlets were sort of digging into some of his responses whenever reporters were asking him about questions, about his fears, about, you know, the sort of there being that flip that, you know, the Democratic Party really just coming in and taking control of things. Um, I know that the president didn't necessarily come out and say specifically that there he had some concern there, but uh, a lot of, you know, they sort of analyzed it, broke it down, and um, he definitely did hint, though he didn't say it specifically, he definitely did hint to a little bit of, of fear there. there. Now, I know past polls will show, past elections will show that typically the president and uh, the political party that is in control tends to sort of flip during midterm elections and I have to say, it's a little bit shocking to find out that that cycle is being a little bit broken. Well, Bruce, it's funny around. that you mentioned that because I have seen a lot of on Trump's Twitter feed that he says, a vote for Republicans is a vote for me. Yes. And that's kind of what we see here. And it's actually interesting. So I'm looking at the headlines right now, and it says, Headcamp Falls in North Dakota Senate race, which is a key pickup for the GOP. And while some politicians are making strides against what their past used to be, like Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney won the Utah Senate seat, launching a new act in his political life. They're making strides, and I think yes. we will see this is going to set the tone for the 2020 presidential election.